My name's Will Boyd-Wallace and I am the Senior Land Management Officer for the Cairngorms National Park Authority and my job uh, is to deal with the many land managers and landowners in the National Park and it's owned by lots of different people, it's not owned by the state so um, and all these different land managers have different objectives across the National Park many many different habitats and many different uh, land, land uses across the National Park ranging from uh, forestry to farming to moorland management for sport purposes, grouse, red grouse, and sporting of red deer as well, and there's fishing and um, you know, all sorts of things going on. Um, I mean, what climate change means for the Cairngorms here, it's, it's a, the Cairngorms is a, a really central point for thinking about it in Scotland, in a sense, because we have the Montane Plateau right in the centre of the National Park, uh, which is a huge area of ground over 1,000 feet, over 300, 400 metres. Um, the biggest extensive area of plateau in, in the country and it's to look at it's very much like an arctic landscape um, and you know there's very very thin soil and very thin vegetation layer uh, on this on this uh, plateau which is largely covered in snow you know for much of the year and lots of species have adapted to that habitat in particular things like ptarmigan and dotterel and lots of uh, plant species as well you know like the montane willows that we have here and this is one of the best places for finding montane willows, but they are a dwindling resource. So, uh, you know, it's a hugely important area for those, those species that are specifically adapted to living in very cold, high environments. And so obviously climate change will have a huge influence on their survival. And, you know, if it warms up and the snow melts, um, you know, the habitats will change. And as a result, it will have a, a big effect on some of those species that I've mentioned. So you've got the Montane Plateau, which I've mentioned, and then moving down off the mountains, you have areas of moorland where you can see burning going on at the moment. They're very actively managed for grouse shooting and uh, maintaining that mosaic of moorland. You know, there's been lots of debate here about uh, whether burning is a good thing or not, because you know, some might argue things carbon going up in smoke. You might think, well, that's just contributing to the to carbon in the atmosphere and uh, leading to more climate change and you know that's a, a strong argument but there are arguments uh, in favour of burning as well for example um, about 40 percent of the park is covered <laughs> in moorland and that's a lot of that is consists of peat soils organic soils and, uh, and uh, that's hugely important science, you know, science has uh, shown that uh, a massive proportion of the carbon on the planet is stored in our peat soils and Scotland's got you know, a, a lot of peat soils, particularly in Caithness and Sutherland and up north, but also here in the Cairngorms we've got large areas of peat. And that, that can be threatened by drainage, uh, it can be threatened by, you know, wildfire, for example, that gets into the peat. Um, and it's important to, to know that the burning that is going on at the moment is in fact one of the things that, you know, creates a, a varied habitat that's important for a number of species, but it does also help to prevent wildfires going through these areas. So. There are pros and cons about that. Um, but these, there's a lot of work going on at the moment trying to find ways of uh, uh, protecting peat in, in the soil and trying to find ways of funding land managers to protect their peat as well, which is really important, I think, for the future. Um, because it's easy to pay people to plant trees and easy to pay them to, to uh, you know, um, put up fences or paths or whatever, but it's very difficult to pay people not to do something, i.e. not to extract peat. So that's one of the challenges that's being looked at, both here and elsewhere in Scotland. So, um, so moving down from the peak, you can see we've got woodland here as well. There's a huge area. 20% of the park is covered in trees. Um, and trees are one of the vital resources, I think, that we have to think about here in terms of um, wood fuel, but local, locally sourced timber and, of course, um, habitat. Um, we're trying to find ways of linking up areas of woodland and other habitats in the National Park so that species like the capercaillie and, and black grouse, red squirrel, um, pine martin, these species can actually move around and, and have bigger areas to live in because the smaller the area then the more fragile they're, they are in a sense. So we're trying to link up these areas and again it means working with the different land managers and owners to do that. Um, so at the moment, as I say, about 20% of the park is covered in trees and arguably there's, there's a lot more space for more trees, but where do they go? And that's one of our biggest challenges is, is working out what the future strategy for land use should be in the National Park and 
get people to work together to, as I say, link up these areas. And then further down we've got farmland, which again is extremely important uh, here. And I, you know, I think as if, if the climate warms up, there's a good chance that farmland uh, could increase because um, as, as things warm up, the, the areas of ground that might be suitable for farming might, might increase. So uh, the scope for expanding farming is there, but it's, that relies hugely on the support available to farmers through Europe and through locally through our, through our own governments. Yeah, the National Park covers uh, about four and a half thousand square kilometres and within that area there's um, about 17,000 people living here. So it's a, you know, it's a strong community, various communities around the National Park that live here. And it is really important that we in the Park Authority and other agencies work with those people very closely to to set the context about climate change and help to make people really aware of the threat of climate change but also the opportunities for how we can actually help adapt to it and mitigate against it as well. So there's been lots of work going on with encouraging people to, to uh, think about climate change through you know, transport but also uh, wood fuel projects and this, this kind of thing which um, we hope will raise it in people's awareness and you know we've done various uh, projects where we found that actually the general awareness about things like, for example, the need to store carbon is very low amongst the land management uh, fraternity. But that's building all the time and uh, hopefully amongst uh, government circles as well we can, we can get uh, an acknowledgement of the need to support people locally in actually doing the things that will help both here but also help globally.